Okay, so it's, uh, it's my pleasure to start uh, the conference. Thank you very much to the organizers. It's always a pleasure to be, to be here in Russia. And um, the idea is to speak a little bit about uh, explosive synchronization, which is a new form of synchronization that you can have in networks when you basically adjust properly the topological uh, properties of the network so that uh, oscillators, phase oscillators are connected in a specific way and it's characterized to be a, a phenomenon which is similar to first order phase transition so it's a discontinuous phenomenon and not reversible and it has many many particular things one of them is that uh, in proximity of this transition you can find a really novel state, a very nice state which was called Bellerophon state and I will try also to to discuss a little bit of this. Next. So the idea of synchronization is a very old idea and it's one of the first things that was uh, basically studied in, uh, in physics and it comes back to Christian Huygens. Eh? So the legend says that he was sick and he observed two pendula hanging at the same beam and he observed that two pendula when they were, I mean, in that uh, configuration, were able to uh, uh, work in sympathy. He said sympathy, next. Eh? Next is uh, this one. So the, the clock were similar, next. And next. And Huygens understood that the fact that they were hanging at the same beam determined a small, tiny uh, 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 coupling between the two pendula, which then imposed a, a work which was basically like this in antiphase. Okay. The two pendula were, 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 were going like this. Okay? Next. Next. Next, 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 next. Stop. <laughs> so uh, in, uh, in modern time, if we want to do something similar, uh, we rely on, uh, on a very simple system which is called the Kuramoto uh, uh, system in which we consider an ensemble of phase oscillator, this strange symbol should be derivative in time. So please, all the times you see this, try to guess uh, derivative in time. So basically you have an ensemble of oscillator, each one of them is characterized by a phase theta, uh, and the derivative of theta is so simple, it's just a frequency. Okay, so the derivative in time of the phase is the frequency. So imagine you have a million of such things uh, which a million of different frequencies which usually are taken by a, a, a non uh, frequency distribution g omega and then the way the best way to figure out them is just to represent them as point on the unit circle because it's a phase so basically these are points which are rotating or count, sorry, rotating or counter rotating depending on the sign of this uh, frequency omega n. So now you take one million, a lot of them, and you couple next, 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 <laughs> uh, next. So you couple them and coupling means you basically imagine that each one of these oscillators is filling the mean field of all the others. So each oscillator has a D, D is a coupling strength, a parameter, a scalar parameter, and it's then coupled to the, all the others. Please, next. Okay, so now click here. I want to show you, click with the mouse here, a movie of what is happening to this system when you increase D. You prepare many, many of such oscillators, you see, that are many points on the unit circle. Click here. No, go, go back, click here. Okay, click here. Doesn't work. <laughs> okay, you don't see the move. <laughs> okay, basically what you would have seen is that this uh, a, a crowd of oscillators will soon block and becomes all together and move like this. That is, they basically lock the phases, they synchronize, and they move with a unique phase and unique frequency around the unit circle. Okay? 
So just to, uh, uh, it's a, a, a nice movie that just to tell you the kind of phenomenon that we want to describe. We want to describe a group, a big group of phase oscillators which suddenly, because of coupling, they become phase synchronized. They have the same phase and same frequencies. Next. 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 Okay, so uh, the way of describing this is by means of uh, a given order parameter that is uh, 1 over the number of oscillators, the modulus of the sum of the unit vectors that uh, are basically individuating each oscillator. So you understand that if the system is completely disordered, that means these oscillators fi are filling the entire circle, this order parameter is almost zero because for each vector here I will have a counter vector there. So when I sum, I get a, a, a something which is almost zero. Whereas when they are phase synchronized, this is one because they are having the same phase, so my vectors are pointing in the same direction and I'm coherently summing up the vectors, so the modulus is rather n, and when I divide by the number of oscillators, I get one. Okay, next. So basically what was in the movie next, 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 is this representation is I have a control parameter d, the coupling strength, and I'm passing from a situation of complete disorder to a situation of complete order. And uh, the key point, and I want to launch the first message of the talk, is what is happening here in the middle. Huh? So uh, I'm going to descri describe a situation in which uh, this passage, instead of being like this, that is continuous, you see, like a continuous line, it's uh, discontinuous, it's something uh, sudden, explosive, uh, it happens uh, uh, suddenly, that is, uh, there is a situation in which uh, an infinitesimal perturbation of D gives rise to a finite size perturbation in the order parameter, and uh, usually is uh, irreversible, because uh, when it is reversible, it means that I can prepare the system here and increase D, and uh, I will do like this, or I can prepare the system here and decrease this, and I will do exactly the same line. So this is fully reversibility. What I'm going to describe is a situation in which instead you have irreversible phenomena. That is, when I go up, I go up suddenly here. But when I prepare the system, I, no, I don't go down in the same point. I go down in a different point. Huh? So I have hysteresis and some very nice phenomenon that I can describe. Next, 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 next. Here is just to see uh, why it's important to describe synchronization phenomena uh, of uh, oscillators. Uh, the most probably important example is the brain. The brain is uh, a big, huge network of uh, oscillators. I mean, it's uh, not phase oscillators, it's uh, spiking oscillators, but it's very close, I mean, you can imagine to have a phase oscillator and a flag all the time, the phase oscillator is passing through the flag, you spike. And, uh, and then you have, uh, of course, in the brain, a lot of synchronization phenomena that you want to more or less understand. The other interesting point is uh, power grids, you know. So in order to maintain uh, the power grid at 50 hertz, you have indeed to uh, uh, synchronize different oscillators, which are the turbines of different uh, uh, places where you produce uh, uh, the power. Next. Next. Okay, so we want to describe this in a network. And when we want to describe in a network, we have to add something. And what we add is just the adjacent symmetric of the network. So now they are not all to all connected, but there is a structure of connection which is described by this uh, matrix. Hmm? And now I am here in the condition of giving you the second message. The second message is this is a cake and there are two main ingredients in the cake. Eh? The first ingredient we already saw is how I distribute the frequencies. So I have many oscillators and I have a frequency distribution. Hmm? The second ingredient in the cake is how I connect the oscillators. So which are the topological properties of the, this matrix and so now the issue is, can I play with these two ingredients to make the cake in a way or in another? That is, to have a continuous or discontinuous transition. Next. Next. 
Next. Next, 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 next. So here you see a few, uh, stop. Here you see the, the, the two transition I wanted uh, just to describe. So if you have a, a, in physics uh, a system that passes from a phase to another phase, in our case is complete incoherence to complete coherence, you can have uh, a transition of the second order like that is a continuous and reversible transition or a transition of this kind which is discontinuous and irreversible next and you will see this contains hysteresis next so now the story begins in Spain that's why I'm looking at uh, Romualdo it begins in Spain with Diego Passo next next okay Diego Passo, uh, who is a very talented guy in Spain, he observed that if I now prepare one of the ingredients, that is the distribution of frequency in a particular way, that is I put one frequency in one node, and then I take all the other node and I equispace the frequency, so omega, omega plus delta, plus two delta, plus three delta, plus four delta, plus five delta, and so on and so forth, whatever is delta, and when I connect them all to all, that is in the original Kuramoto, I see a discontinuous transition. Hmm? This is a very interesting observation. However, he already uh, point out that this is a sort of singular case in the sense that only if I make this arrangement, I get a first order transition, a discontinuous transition. The moment in which I put some noise in this frequencies, I immediately leave the discontinuity and I get back to a continuous transition. So you understand this is a sort of measure zero realization of a homogeneous frequency distribution. Because out of all possible realization of a homogeneous frequency distribution, there is also the realization in which the, the frequencies are equispaced. Okay? So out of this, if I take that specific uh, yeah, so it's uh, interesting, but it's a li little bit limited. So we want to have something more general and more robust to be able to claim that these things indeed happens in nature. Next. And we remain in Spain. Next, next, next. Sorry, no, before. Previous, okay. So, uh, and there was uh, later on uh, a, a nice contribution by a series of Spanish colleagues who demonstrated that, uh, actually they claimed, that the necessary condition, and we will see that they're not actually the necessary condition, but it's a sufficient condition and not necessary. The necessary condition is that when you have a network, this network has to have heterogeneity, that is, it must be scale free, uh, it must be, it has to have a, a degree distribution which is not homogeneous, and it must have, following them, a rule, a proportionality rule between the frequencies of the oscillators and the degree of the node. That is, the hub should be a very fast oscillator and the uh, uh, other nodes should be very slow oscillators. If they prepare the system like this, they obtain indeed this discontinuous transition. Next. If they prepare scale-free, but they don't correlate, they see continuous transition. If, if they correlate, but they, they don't have a, 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 a network uh, like scale-free, they, they take a, an Erdos-Reni, for example, they take an homogeneous one, they get again a, a continuous transition. Once again, first of all, this is a little bit too far-fetched. Uh, claim, we will see that uh, the condition is sufficient and not uh, uh, actually uh, necessary. But the um, important point here is that again it's limited because if you impose a priori a proportionality between degree and, uh, and the frequency, you basically are saying that given a network you have only one frequency distribution that make this network to explode. Eh? So if you have a degree distribution, the frequency distribution should be the same because they are proportional. Hmm? You understand the point? So this is a sort of gain of limiting the case. And now let me move to uh, the point that I want to start demonstrating that in fact, this is much more general. And I want to demonstrate it step by step. Next. 
Okay, so first of all, we uh, go next, 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 slowly. So we started to make an experiment, next, 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 with electronic circuit. And we showed that indeed, in the experiment with electronic circuit, you see the, uh, this first order light transition. Next. Okay. The first point I want to start my discussion is, uh, in fact, I have two recipes. And I want, don't want them to be correlated as in the case before. So I want uh, to choose uh, to maintain separated the, 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 the frequency distribution, the way I select the frequency and the way I select the network. So the first um, uh, things I want to tell you is, let's now imagine that you give me the network. Oh, sorry, you give me, sorry, <laughs> you give me the frequencies, okay? So you choose the frequency distribution. And now I'm demonstrating you that I can always find a network given a generic and arbitrary frequency distribution. At least I can construct a network that make this distribution to explode. And so the, the process is the following, continue, 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 stop. And it's based on the fact that when you have a continuous line, you have uh, a process that leads to the final synchronization, which uh, happens by means of clusters, that is, you have here, I cannot, otherwise I would have got back to the, my, you have here D, you have here the parameter, and you have this second order transition. So here what you have is a system in which all the oscillators are free running. They have their own frequency, they are not uh, coupled. And here, all of them are coupled. So what is happening here? There, what is happening is that at a given point, actually here, you start forming some seed of synchronization. Imagine that you have this C, this big, big C of uh, oscillators which are free, but there are two oscillators which have uh, close by frequencies, by chance. So when you increase the coupling strength, these two oscillators will start to lock. So you will have a group of two oscillators with locked, and all the rest unlocked. Here, here, there. So we'll have the formation of seeds of microclusters, okay, uh, which will coexist with the thermal bath of oscillators, which are instead completely incoherent. Now, what happens to these uh, to, to the seeds? They can do two things when you increase V. First of all, they can grow. That is, they can attract more and more of oscillators which are free. I have a lot of oscillators which are free. They can come to me. So I can grow from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 and so on. The second thing they can do is they can merge. So I have one cluster here, one cluster there, and suddenly they merge. Boom, they become a larger cluster. Eh? of oscillators. So in this process of growing, merging, growing, merging, growing, merging, growing, merging, growing, merging, I end up with a unique cluster, which is the entire system. So this is the process. And now I want to tell you that in order to have a first order, you have to basically introduce some frustration mechanism in this process of growing and merging. So either you impede to this cluster to grow, or you impede to this cluster to merge. So then you freeze your system. Your system is frozen, cannot change. It will stay here up to when it will explode. I mean, it will go all together to the, uh, to the, to the uh, coherent state. So the first method is you give me now the frequency distribution. So I put on my table all my oscillators, and I put all the frequencies because you gave me the frequency distribution. I have no way of choosing the frequency you gave to me. And then I take a random pair of nodes, i, j, next, and check next, and check if the frequency difference is larger than a given threshold. If this frequency difference is larger than a given threshold, I put a link. Otherwise, I don't. So basically what I do here, I construct a network, huh? in which there is never connections between two close-by oscillators in frequency. 
So I avoid the formation of this microcluster. Remember that the microcluster happens when two networks are very close in frequency. There will be networks, uh, sorry, uh, units very close in frequency, but they will never be coupled. So continue next, next, next. So I continue constructing this up to get what I want, a given network with mean degree, or if you want, with number of connection L next. I use this here, and you see what happens. If my threshold is zero, so basically I'm constructing an Erdos-Rheny because I'm taking a pair of nodes and I'm putting always the connection, OK? I don't have uh, uh, this continuity. I have a very nice and continuous transition. And then when I increase the threshold, I get to a point in which the transition is very sudden. Uh, and it's uh, not reversible because if I prepare the system here and I go back, the transition happens here instead of here. Okay, so you see a beautiful hysteresis. Next, 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 stop. So uh, what you, uh, happens here is, uh, uh, what is very nice about this is that it, uh, it works, so you see, for all possible frequency distribution. This is a, Ga a Gaussian frequency distribution. This is an asymmetric frequency distribution. But uh, it, uh, the method introduces, as an emergent phenomenon, also correlation between degree and uh, frequency, which is, however, not linear as it was uh, uh, said by our uh, uh, Spanish friends, but is V-shaped. And the reason is very simple. If I am here, this oscillator, since I have a, a, an area in which of frequencies in which I cannot make connection, my expected degree will be the integral of the g omega of the distribution of frequency here and there. So I put a threshold and then I make the integral of g omega outside the area in which I'm prohibited to make connections. And as a matter of fact, I can therefore calculate analytically and reproduce numerically the, de the, the final degree of the nodes as a function of their uh, frequency. And I see that it's a very nice V-shaped uh, condition. So <coughs> it happens then when you create a first order transition like, you, so you have an associated phenomenon of emergent correlation between degree of the node and frequency of the node itself, which is not, however, linear. So basically, uh, is not uh, a simple correlation. Next, next. OK, so now, first step. The second step is uh, you give me everything. So you give me the frequency distribution and also the network. So I am not now able to, to change the network. <coughs> and I want to show you that in this condition, yet, what I can do is I can put weights on each one of the links of the network so that the network is uh, explosive. So what I do, you see here you have Aij. If I say next, this transforms in omega j. That is, you put the, here some, uh, some weight. And the weight are simple, are the same philosophy as before. If you are close by in frequency, you see, your weight is small. So the weight is uh, proportional to a power of the difference in frequency. Eh? So the more you're close in frequency, the less you wait for positive alpha. And now, yes, yes, it's OK, it's OK. And now you have something even more interesting that uh, when alpha is 0, you see this is unweighted because all, for all frequency difference to the power 0, this is 1. So here you recover the normal continuous transition. OK? But when alpha is equal to 1, what you have is a sort of universal transition that does not depend on the frequency distribution. It only depends on the network topology. OK? So for a given network, when alpha is equal to 1, if you take uniform distribution or Gaussian distribution or bimodal, Rayleigh, semi-Gaussian, whatever, you see always the same uh, going up and always the same going down. So really, it's a property of the network itself in this case. It's not the property anymore of the frequency distribution. 
Next, I have only 15 minutes and I have a lot of things to tell you. Next, next, next. So uh, you can do something even more interesting because if you want to modulate the hysteresis, you can use a second, a more refined uh, uh, network property, which is the betweenness between, uh, uh, I mean, the load of each link. And so you can now use a weight which is proportional to the frequency difference and moreover proportional to the load of the link to a given power beta. And this is able to basically change the width of the hysteresis. So to make your transition uh, uh, more or less irreversible. Okay, or if you want, more or less reversible <laughs> in the other sense. Please continue, continue. Oh, continue, continue. So. Why this is interesting, there are many, many applications of this, but since I have uh, only a limited time, I will concentrate in one application. Uh, one application is, for example, you can create a magnetic, permanent magnetic state of synchronization. When you go to Moscow and you buy, uh, you know, this magnet that you plug on your refrigerator, is because uh, those are uh, in the hysteretic area, you know, they are this... Uh, uh, fields in which uh, by an external field somebody oriented all the magnetic spins in one way and then they remain forever. Same can happen here. So you can uh, prepare yourself in the aesthetic uh, area. You are in the, in the level down, so you are here in the incoherent state. So imagine you have uh, this transition. You prepare yourself here. So by an external field you orient all the phases in one direction and these phases remain oriented forever. Okay, so this is one application that you can make of particular use, for example, in power grid. You orient uh, your turbines one forever and they remain oriented and they remain locked forever without any uh, 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 things to do. But I want now to describe an interesting phenomenon which is the appearance of these Bellerophon states. And the issue is this. If I'm now basically able, now I know how to use the ingredients, and now I will prepare a system such that, depending on, the param on one parameter of my system, I can be first order or second order. Okay? So I know that if I am second order, here I have clusters. If I am first order, I don't have clusters. If I now put myself in the three critical point, that is, I put my parameter exactly in the point in which I am uh, either first order on the left or second order on the right. Should I have cluster or shouldn't I? On one side I don't have, the other side I do have. What happens in the middle? Next. In the middle, you will have these states, uh, which are cluster indeed, but which are completely different cluster with respect to the usual cluster and also to the usual states that were called chimera states. First of all, the oscillator that belongs to each cluster, they are not locked in frequency and phase. So if I look the distribution of their phases, they are not locked. If I uh, look the distribution of their frequency, they are also not locked. But they are locked in long time average frequencies. So if I take, if I observe the average frequencies of these oscillators for long time, they are locked. This means that each instantaneous frequency is a periodic uh, function of time. So suppose that I have now some oscillators here in a given range of uh, natural frequencies. They, at a given time, will have this shape of instantaneous frequency. Then I will, they will have this shape, then 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 this shape. They will do... So that when you make a long time average, it's constant over your cluster, okay? But this will produce a very, very particular uh, 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 um, situa situation because uh, if I now represent all these oscillators here in the unit circle, they will do a movement like this. They will stay in a given phase they will disperse and get back to the phase, the opposite phase. They will disperse and get back to the opposite phase. And this periodically, okay? Moreover, 
The other interesting point is that they are accommodated into a sort of uh, quantized mean frequency situation. That is, I don't have only one cluster. I will have many clusters, one here, one here, one here, one here, and so on. And this cluster will have average frequency omega 1. This cluster will have average frequency three times omega 1. This cluster will have average frequency five times omega 1, and so on and so forth. So they are quantized in that sense. And the quantization is because in the time in which uh, the members of this cluster make one movement like this on the unit circle, the member of this cluster makes three times the same job. The members of this cluster do five times the same job, and so on and so forth. Which implies, on that other sense, that they are asymptotic state but not stationary. And uh, if I calculate the global order parameter on each one of this cluster, I don't have a value, but I have a time-dependent value, which is period 1 here, period 3 here, period 5 here, period 7 there, and so on and so forth. Next. Sorry, eh? So I prepare my system in this way. I have 10 minutes. I prepare my system in this way. This is a Kuramoto model. But look at here. The different oscillators are differently coupled to the mean field. OK? So this is a mean field. And this is Ki. And Ki is nothing but K times a parameter, which is the coupling strength, times the absolute value of the frequency. OK? So the oscillators we ha with higher frequency, they are more connected to the, the mean field. Hmm? And then I use, uh, as a second ingredient, uh, a bimodal Lorentzian distribution, which is written like this. And then, therefore, I have a parameter omega 0 divided by delta. Omega 0 is the position of the peaks. You see, omega minus omega 0, omega plus omega 0. This is a and delta is the width of the two uh, distributions. So depending on this uh, parameter, I can be first order, you see, with hysteresis, or second order. Hmm? And what I do now, I put myself exactly in the middle. I select delta omega 0 divided by delta here, so that if I move a little bit on one side, I am discontinuous. If I move uh, a little bit on the other side, I am continuous. Correct? Next. This, is can, this is actually can be calculated analytically because the system is solvable. And uh, you can calculate the threshold for the forward transition and the threshold for the backward transition analytically. So you see that the three critical point is when these two thresholds coincide. That is when omega 0 par divided by delta is square root of 3. <coughs> Please, next. What I do like this, I put myself there, and I now increase the coupling strength. So coupling strength, very small coupling strength. I have here three plots as a function of the frequencies. Here I put the phases, the instantaneous phases. Here I put the instantaneous frequencies. Now you see the derivative is OK. It's theta full dot. It's not that strange. Uh, and here I put the average of the instantaneous frequency. So you see. When the, no, please go back. OK, so when uh, the, the system here is uh, not coupled, I have nothing in the phases, no uh, synchronization in the frequency, which is, you know, and no synchronization in the average frequency. When everything is synchronized for very large coupling, I have phases which are completely locked, instantaneous frequencies completely locked, and uh, average frequency completely locked. In the middle, I have the formation of this Tarkay's situation. You see? Look at here. You have this cluster, this, 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 this. Elements of this cluster, they have a constant average frequency. But their instantaneous frequency is not constant. Look at here, which is probably better. You have many of such clusters. Inside the cluster, you have a cusped situation, exactly what I depicted here. The instantaneous frequencies are cusped.
But this is a snapshot. If I take the next snapshot, the cusp will be this, then this, then this, then this. The phases are not locked. Look here. This cluster, I have a phase at pi and a phase at minus pi. So they are really taking all the possible, you know, uh, positions in the unit circle. And, and so instantaneous phases are not locked. Instantaneous frequency, they are not locked. Average frequency, they are locked. Instantaneous frequency, they are time periodic. And what else? There is this uh, quantization. You see the difference. This, uh, this, uh, sorry, this value is exactly equal to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. Next. Now, I don't know if you see the movie, but I prepared here a movie and here another movie in which I, s here you will see the cluster number one, number three, number four, number five, uh, sorry, number one, three, five, seven, and you will see this cluster doing like this, at the same time, this doing like this three times, much uh, this time doing like this five times, and so on and so forth. So exactly what I described to you. Unfortunately, you don't see the movie, so we pass to the next uh, uh, slide. Next. And this is what I was commenting you. If I now concentrate on each one of the cluster, and I calculate uh, the R parameter, that is uh, 1 over N, uh, the, the modulus of the, I have a rhythmic uh, value. R is, uh, in general, a complex number. So if I take the real part, an imaginary part of the <coughs> order parameter, I have in cluster 1 a very nice limit cycle, period 1. In cluster 3, I have a very nice uh, period 3 limit cycle. In cluster 5, I have a very nice period 5 limit cycle, and so on and so forth. So I have all these odd numbered uh, period limit cycles. And this is obviously re represented by the temporal frequency. So if I, if I take two elements of this cluster and I report their frequency, you see they are not locked, but they are periodic in time. Eh? They are periodic in time with different uh, shift, but they are periodic in time. Next. So next point was, uh, uh, okay, we describe this as a sort of um, uh, emergent phenomenon close by to a tricritical point. Now, tricritical points are very, very difficult to be found in nature because you have always, you know, a lot of noise and so on and so forth. So, we want now to generalize this and to show you that this is, in fact, something that you can observe really. And therefore, we prepared uh, a different, a completely different uh, um, system. And in this completely different system, you basically have two populations of oscillators. Eh? One which is positively coupled with the mean field and the other one which is negatively coupled with the mean field. So the idea is that the coupling can have only two values, k, a positive value, which is applied to a group of oscillators which we call conformist because they follow the mean field, eh? and the other is negative, and uh, this will be applied to a group of other oscillators which we call contrarians because they go against the mean field. Eh? So uh, it, what happens is that if you prepare your system initially by all contrarians, so all the oscillators are negatively coupled, then there is no synchronization at all. But then you take a, par a portion of contrarians and you switch to conformist. Eh? And as a function of this percentage, you get a point in which you get synchronization. Next. In particular, you have three ways of uh, uh, making this procedure. The first way is at random. You take a percent, one percent of the contrarians and you flip the conformist, whatever. Or you use uh, the frequency this, uh, of these contrarians and you use the first one percent or the last one percent in the frequency, uh, I mean, order. Eh? So the second is you take, uh, you rank the contrarians according to the natural frequencies, and then you flip orderly eh, from the largest to the smallest, or in the case, from the smallest to the largest. <coughs> in all cases, again, the, syst the system is treatable, so you have analytic solution for the various uh, 
sta uh, stuff. And when you take a Lorentz probability density, that is uh, for the frequency, you get the following. Next. Here's there is a matrix because you have case one. So uh, this is uh, random flipping, ordered flipping from minimum to maximum, ordered flipping from maximum to minimum. And then you have three cases also because you have two values of k plus and k minus. They can be equal in absolute value, or one can be larger than the other, or the other can be larger than the one. So you have a three times three matrix of possibilities. And so if you depict the phase space, the parameter space, you see that in all cases you have this strange uh, situation which includes Bellerophon states in the middle. So indeed these states are not pertinent to the proximity of uh, a, a tricritical point, but they occur in uh, more, so to say, uh, standard uh, system. Next. And then you can also make some trick, uh, you can uh, um, continue. So the, 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 the system are the same. You see these are again the same uh, plot as before. So they have uh, exactly the same characteristic as the Bellerophon state. Next. And then you can make uh, <coughs> the something even better. So you can mix the two cases. That is a bimodal frequency distribution plus double. Uh, a double population, contrarians and conformists, and then now you have very other nice fields which are superpositions of odd numbered and even, num even numbered Bellerophon states, which gives you the very, very strange behavior of your um, um, R factor, that is, of your order parameter. Next. So if you are interested in this and other things, this is more or less the list of things you can read. Uh, synchronization, there are several books. Uh, and of course, then the, the other one has concentrated on my own papers. But in any case, uh, uh, dynamical systems in network, you can read two very large physics reports. Uh, the explosive synchronization from Pazzo and a group of other Spanish to now, it's uh, contained in this more or less uh, references. And Bellerophon states, you find them here. Next. Thank you for your patience.